replay. I've got my little elephant cup here to make things memorable. And today, I've got me a guitar. Because one of the things that comes up a lot is the question of can you memorize music with mnemonics? And of course the answer is absolutely 100% yes. You can use mnemonics to memorize anything. There's really nothing that I've encountered that it can at least help with. And um, music is one of those things. However, we always got to start with the question of what is music? What does this word music mean? And uh, it can mean lots of things. It can mean the positions of the notes on strings. It can mean terminology for music. By the way, if you're hopping on the live, say hello. Let me know where you are in the world. Uh, let me know a little bit about your favorite music and are you studying music? Are you interested in the major system or major method and do you use it? And if if not, you're in for a real treat because this really applies to a lot of things, including chess, actually. So we're going to dive into that. And of course, if you have any questions and so forth, you can feel free to pop them into the chat box. Hit that thumbs up. And let's talk a little bit about music and mnemonics. I just was playing this morning and I thought, yeah, let's, uh, let's chat about this. So one of the things that we got to consider here is that the major method or the major system is going to be our basis for doing this. And we know that everything is arranged in space and that everything that is arranged in space can have a numerical coordinate, right? So that's how uh, Google Maps works. That's how it gets you gets you around when you have the uh, the Google thing in your hands, you know. And uh, so, if you want to be guided around, you got to have uh, have numbers, basically. And it's the same thing here. Everything here can be represented by a number. So this is the seventh fret, right? And it's not just the seventh fret, but it's the seventh fret on the A string. And the A string, we could even give a number. Some people would number it the fifth string, some people would number it the second string. Let's just forget about the strings having numbers and let's just use them what they're called. So E, A, uh, D, and G, right? I think that's right. Anyway, <laughs> um, we're going to uh, assign them a character then, each one. So Ernie, Al Pacino, Dracula, and Grover. You might not know those characters, I know them. Anybody here know them? If you're just hopping on, say hello, let me know where you are in the world. Hit that thumbs up. And uh, it's really, really simple just to give each string a character, right? So that's what I have. I'm only naming the first four not only to save a little bit of time, but also because I play bass. So uh, I, I have five strings on my favorite bass, but... And that's a B string, which is lower above here. Martin says hello from Argentina. Hello, Martin. Great to see you. Thanks for chiming in. Love to hear from you guys and uh, interact a little bit. That's what's so cool about this medium is that we can be live and interact. So let's use it that way. Martin's playing the guitar, so the timing is great. Awesome. Um, yeah, so I don't know if you know the major method. Let me know. Uh, the idea is is that you associate numbers with sounds, with consonants. I always say sounds, but actually it's consonants. But really what you're going for is that once you have the consonants in place, you put them together and then you can make words. And it's really powerful for doing things that are position-based where you have numbers. Oh, Julie's here. Thank you for your emails uh, and uh, for saying hello. Always good to see you. And uh, thanks for being here and saying hello. Let me know if you play music. Oh, Emerson's Coffee, Bike, and Rum shop is here. All right, good timing. Paul's here from Canada. I'd love to see all the regulars. They're really great, and, and new faces as well when they're new. So thanks for saying hello. And let me know about what music you play. And uh, uh, some of what I'm going to say, well, it applies to just about every instrument, really, because every instrument has some, some sort of spatial thing. So flutes have keys, saxophones have keys, trumpets have keys. Um, the trombone, when I played trombone, we had numbers, you know, it's like the first, before we were learned the notes, first position, second position, I think it was seven in, in all, um, if I remember correctly. Um, and uh, that was years ago. Uh, Julie says, <laughs> just started ukulele this week. All right, awesome. So this is gonna help you actually. And uh, when you know the major method, you can then associate very easily to space that numbered space, let's call it. So 
just quickly for those who don't know the major method, it's a way of memorizing numbers and creating images that lets you do it. And the beauty of this is that every single part of a guitar is numbers. If you got an 88 key piano, well every single key on that piano can be represented by a number. It doesn't, I'm sure that there are instruments where this wouldn't apply, but I'm not sure what they are. Um, and uh, certainly, uh, I, I believe in the, in, the, in the sitar tradition, there's a much more numerical naming convention uh, association between string and fret and, uh, and the name. Not entirely sure about that, but I think so. And in any case, so zero classically is, is associated with a, a, an S or a Z or a soft C. Now, on previous videos, I've talked about how you could help yourself remember that. It's one of those rare instances where I say, look, yes, you can think about snakes eating their tails, which gives you this zero shape, and that's, and, and it's a snake, right? So S, and also the snake can be snoring while it does that, so you get the Z association. And you can have Cookie Monster reaching through that circular snake to dip his, his um, cookies in some milk, so they're getting soft, right? Cookie Monster Soft C. So now zero, you'll remember, is associated with a S or a soft C or a Z, right? That's one way of doing it. And then two, for example, just to skip one, because one is a little uh, tougher, but two is N, and that can be associated with a, um, uh, like Noah, for example, took the animals onto the ark in pairs, so two N, and you can make the association that way. Anyway, it's, don't, I think it's one of the things that you just don't want to wrestle with. Just get the major in your head. It's really, really powerful. Flower Cow's here from Mexico. Oh, so good to see you always. Glad you're here. Thanks for saying hello. And if you're hopping on the live and you haven't said hello yet, please do so. We're hanging out. I think it's Sunday for most of you. It's Monday morning for me, and I just, I was playing music, writing some new stuff, and uh, I thought, hey, I get so many questions all the time about memorizing music, and this is how you do it. So, major. Um, zero, soft, C, S, or Z. One is a T or D, and I guess it's pretty easy to memorize that as well. If you just see that a T has a one in it, one downstroke, and a D has a one downstroke in it as well, both capital and um, and uh, small caps. N also, well, we talked about N just now, but it also has two downstrokes, which is uh, also a way to help remember that N is associated with two. Three is an M usually. I mean, you can make up your own. You don't have to accept these ones, but they're super convenient because they're there and they work. Some people have argued that actually these were chosen because of certain relationships between the, the brain and the shape of the mouth and so forth. I never really quite followed that argument, but uh, interesting anyway. And, uh, oh, Natural Flow's here. Guten Tag. Uh, it's, it's good to see you. Um, schön, dass du hier bist. <laughs> Vielen Dank dass du hallo gesagt hast. I gotta really take every chance I get to practice German because it's starting to de-skill for me. Um, so thanks for being here and thanks for saying hello. Hit thumbs up, let me know if you're hopping on this. Three is M. M, you can see a mustache on its side or McDonald's has sort of three lines in the M, etc. Four is an R. That's a little bit of a trickier one, but maybe you know, you know four people named Richard. Um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, four is almost like an R going backwards. Five is easy as L when you hold your hand out like that. Looks like an L and you got five fingers. Six, C H S H J sound, soft G sound. Um, uh, Natural flow says, Danke, ich freue mich zufällig gesehen zu haben, dass du online bist. Wunderbar. Vielen Dank. So, uh, uh, for those of you who don't know German, he's just saying he's happy to, to have the to chance upon uh, seeing me online. Very good. So glad you're here. Um, yeah, so six has lots of options, right? Soft G, C, H, S, H, J, that kind of stuff. Um, and some other people use different things. Then seven is K. I just go for hard K. <laughs> just K it. <laughs> Eight is, a, is a, an F or a B sound and nine is a B or a P. So, we've covered already now that we've got a number of strings, 
what, what, what really helps is if you have a zero, zero to 99. And what that means is that taking this major that we just talked about, major system or major method, I prefer to call it a major method actually, but it's bad for keywords on the internet because most people are searching for major system, but it's not really a system. And the reason why it's not a system is because it's a, you, could, you ultimately will decide upon what you use, which consonants you use, and so you, every person has to create it as their own system, and so really it's a method. You're, you're using the method of association to create a major system. Yes, I know I get lost in the uh, little fine details, but actually the fine details matter, and that's why I get lost in them, because that's where all the advantages are when you want to improve things. So you gotta look into that stuff. It's like uh, taking an outer, uh, uh, a, a space plane, whatever you call those things, spaceships up into outer space. You know, you, you got to optimize in order to get farther, to get to Mars and so forth. So if you can reduce a screw by a millimeter, then you're going to save fuel and you're going to get farther, bigger bang for your buck. So that's why these things, these definitions matter. It's why I pause upon them. And uh, someone was uh, yelling at me in, in the uh, comments on a previous video about how there's too much theory uh, in... Uh, the magnetic memory method uh, YouTube stuff and I, I said well uh, fair enough but uh, if I don't do it who will because no one else is showing up to do the theory and that's where all the advantages are so correct me if I'm wrong but this stuff matters somebody's got to address it natural flow says I used basketball players with their jersey numbers 0 0 to 50 he added an action and an object for everyone. Rest, I went with associations rather than major. Not sure how it well works beyond the 51, or beyond the 50. Well, then just use something else. I mean, if, if actual basketball players, 0, 0 to 50, by the way, thanks for sharing that. Um, that's very useful for people, because some people don't know that there are pre-existing things that you can use uh, to do that. So you don't have to do it with the major. You can, you can do it with anything and as I talked about on a previous uh, video in the playlist that I'll be adding this live to you you can have an arbitrary association or a non arbitrary association and what uh, what has just been suggested is really kind of a bit of both it's it's non arbitrary and arbitrary at the same time but the major is got an arbitrary um, uh, aspect to it but it's ultimately non arbitrary because whenever you select for zero, 00, for example, I have Thomas Zaz, and it's arbitrary that 0 is S, or soft C or Z, but it's not arbitrary that I chose Zaz because I'm relying upon that principle in the method, right? And so Zaz, but you could use Dr. Zeus, and I'm sure there's lots of other, other things. So zero, 00 is that way, and every string on here is, is a zero, 00. So that's why every string has a character for the string, based on the, the name. And so open is zero, 00, but it's open with Ernie from Sesame Street, right? So every time that I would want to memorize an open note on the E string, then if I needed to memorize that, it's just Ernie in a fist fight with Thomas Zaz. Done, right? Now, zero, 01 for me is sad, but you gotta push it. So sad is too abstract. What does that mean? It's a great word. It works because zero is S and uh, D uh, or one can be T or D. So that makes the word sad. Now, that's not concrete enough though. So it's the tragedy mask for me. Sadness, right? Woo! But not just any tragedy mask. A little known fact is that William Shatner played Oedipus in a play, which you can watch for free on uh, YouTube. It's just the greatest recording. You don't really know it's William Shatner. It doesn't really matter. Just trivia in my head. But in any case, it's that tragedy mask when after Oedipus pokes out his eyes and that's what I see. And so it's very, very specific. And that's zero, 01, right? On the E string. So whatever's gonna happen there, if I have to memorize this, which sometimes happens. Now, Ernie has concluded his fist fight with, uh, with um, Thomas uh, Zaz, and uh, so now he's gonna get in a fight with William Shatner wearing his tragedy mask. Now, let's say we need to remember that we're going to F sharp, and we wanna remember that it's sharp, not G flat, for example. Um, well, 
the forward movement can involve a knife. And any time that we need a flat, or we need to know that it's a flat, then we can have a hammer. So in essence, every single fret has the potential to be something. So if we go down to the G string um, here, and now we're on the seventh fret, so we're gonna call that 07. We know that G is the Grover character from Sesame Street. And now for me, this is, all of these sevens are Oliver Sacks. And so all that has to happen is Grover has to do something with Oliver Sacks. Now here is D, right? Um, and so that is Dracula on that string. So now it's Oliver Sacks doing something with Dracula. And then over here, right? We have F again, but this F is not this F. This has a different spatial position. So this F is um, Derek Sivers, S-I-V, because it's on the eighth uh, fret. And uh, it's, uh, uh, anyway, zero eight, right? Because we don't, we need two numbers in order to make the word using the major method. So it's gotta be zero eight. That's why it's Sivers, Derek Sivers. So. And then if you needed help memorizing that, it's just a simple thing of uh, Grover with Oliver Sacks, and then Dracula with Oliver Sacks, sorry. Uh, Grover with Oliver Sacks, Dracula with Oliver Sacks, and then Derek Sivers, right? With Al Pacino in this case, because this is the A string. For you, it could be uh, Albert Einstein, or it could be um, all kinds of people, right? And if you string that all together and you're struggling with music, then I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this. I'm, the whole purpose here is not to perform music or anything like that. But um, if you do this and you're, if you're struggling to remember something like, then you can just simply see little pictures like that and you'll remember where those are supposed to be. that I didn't uh, do that for every single phrase but whenever I was looking at the sheet music and it was sticky and I didn't want to sit there and look back and look back and look back and look back again and again and again I just make little stories and then you have it in your mind and you can get it into muscle memory like that and it's beautiful because there's nothing worse than looking back at things and then going and then making a mistake and so forth you just make little stories on the spatial positioning of the instrument. And this, I haven't done this with trombone, but it would work exactly the same way. I haven't done it with, uh, I've done it a bit with piano, same thing. And you can apply it in many, many different ways. If you wanted to learn the Phrygian mode as opposed to the Mixolydian mode, or uh, you, know, you wanted to learn all the modes and stuff like that, easy peasy lemon squeezy. You just then use this to help you memorize what notes and where they would belong on there. So Flyerkow says, awesome. Thanks, and uh, thanks for letting me know you like that. Julie says, I think the association is based on where consonants are made in the mouth. Only difference is if consonants are voiced or voiceless, i.e. T, D, made in the same spot, T is voiceless, D is voiced. Yeah, that's interesting. Phonetic consonants work in pairs, T, D, P, B, etc. makes logic of major method very easy. Ah, okay, okay, yeah, I see, I see. Yeah, uh, that explains it a bit better, actually, than where I had heard this sort of mouth uh, relationship very good very good um also nine happens to sort of look like a, a p or a b but then again eight doesn't right look like an f or a b um in any case that's really that and uh it's just super exciting to have that skill and again using it for entire compositions maybe not but just for little things where it's sticky and so forth because then you get into what really matters in music memorization, which is dedicated practice. And I'll give you a, a little tip for what I do. Um, 
I make a little flub here and there, like all musicians do, and there's no uh, getting around that in life. But dedicated practice is really awesome, and a lot of people don't know this. So let's say you're you're learning something, and you keep making a mistake. Well, what people often do is they go back to the beginning of the song and they play all the way up to the mistake, and then they make the mistake again. But what you can do instead is let's say the mistake is in bar 35. Well, you can play bar 35 over and over and over and over again, and then add bar 36, and play bar 35 and 36 over and over and over again. And then you can go to bar 34 and play 34 and 35 over and over and over again, and then do 34, 35, 36 over and over and over again. Now you do that maybe 10 times for each pass or something like that, then go back to the beginning of the song, and then when you reach that, you're gonna get it. So maybe something else from Bach that would illustrate this. I don't have the bars in front of me. You don't memorize the sheet music, uh, although you could. Um, so uh, I'm not really, no, I don't know the number of the bar that this is from, but. Oh, something like that. So like I say, I'm screwing up something like that, right? So then instead of going back to, I might just go. I go back to see what I mean and just nail that sort of thing and get that get that then either go forward and and then go forward and then or back and then forward anyway go like this uh, natural flow says interleaved learning for music just got that new connection as an idea thank you yeah it's it's interleaving we, we in music world we call it dedicated practice um, now there's a language learning connection to that as well. So, what did I learn in Chinese recently? Yo shen ma bu yi yang. So, when I have problems with this, then what I need to do is, uh, and my pronunciation is still not great, but instead of like going uh, always to the beginning, yo shen ma then I could actually just go, it's like I'm stuck on uh, uh, Bu Yi Yang, so I can just go Bu Yi Yang, Bu Yi Yang, or even Yi Yang, Yi Yang, Yi Yang, and, and really get that in there, right? And then go back. And so you can do it inside of, of phrases. Maybe that's not the best example, but you can certainly do it in language learning as well, and then get your muscle memory working a lot better. So that's that. And uh, I guess the other thing that I was, I mean, it doesn't have to be these Bach sort of things that I was doing. Um, it could also be just chords, right? So if a song has uh, G and C and A minor and D, then you can you can make well you don't you don't necessarily use the major method for that, although you could, because the chords A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, they all have um, numbers, right? They are a number in the alphabet. So instead of rem trying to remember, well, is it, is it G or C, then you could give each of those a number and then actually use the major method to remember the numbers of the chords. And in jazz, they often do this, like the 357 and so forth. So that's an option. It's not exactly the same thing, but something like that. Um, or you can just make words out of the chords. Yeah, Chris is a... Uh, how about playing a 357? Well, I'm not, I, I'm not a jazz musician, but you could just remember 357. Um, uh, and there's other variations that you might be called upon. Uh, I wouldn't say that my musicianship is that that advanced and I don't do improv or anything like that, although I certainly would like to in the future. In any case, um, the guy really to talk about this stuff with more than myself is John McFedrin and he's just, he's got this stuff and we have an interview with him on the Magnetic Memory Method podcast. And uh, I know for a fact he's doing a course on this stuff. We've talked for hours about it. He's got slightly different approaches and so forth, but he's got things from music that are just incredible. So check that that out uh, for sure. Uh, what else? Oh yeah, and then there's just the thing of like memorizing lyrics, right? So I don't know if I should torture you guys with my singing, but uh, <laughs> there's a, there is the option of memorizing lyrics and then you have to think about like, how are you going to actually play songs with, uh, 
with music while you're playing it. So that can be quite a challenge. And I'm not a master of it. I'm not a singer as such, although I love to sing. Uh, and, and trying to do it uh, on YouTube is, is going to be a fun thing. But, you know, how did that go? Something like Sie hat uns nicht gefragt, als wir noch kein Gesicht, ob wir, lieb, uh, ob wir lieben haben oben oder nicht. This is like years ago. <laughs> ich gehe uh, ganz allein durch eine große Stadt und ich frage, ob es mir lieber hat. Something like that. Ich schaue in die Stube durch Tür und Fensterglas und ich warte und ich warte auf was? Auf etwas. Aber was? Then it's something like, wenn ich mir was wünschen dürfte, heim ich in Verlegenheit. Wenn ich mir was wünschen sollte, eine gute, oh oh, eine, uh, ah, I can't remember now. Eine gute, oh, uh, eine, hm. Is it either a good or a schlimmer Zeit or a schlimmer or a good Zeit? In any case, it's a, it's a really beautiful song and I've totally butchered it. Sorry, Marlene Dietrich. But um, when, I was, when I was originally memorizing that years ago, I tried to just figure out what the lyrics were and I remember the Memory Palace in Berlin and uh, it involved being at, at uh, just seeing Marlene Dietrich. Like she sings it very famously. I don't know if she wrote it or not. But she becomes the figure that follow through the memory palace. And then I couldn't really figure out the notes, so I just sort of made up the notes that sounded right for me. And then just figuring it out and starting to play it and going through the lyrics and just working it out. And then when you hit a sticky spot, like I even still, I haven't played this for years, but I still have the sticky spot that I had back then. And so what I would need to do is dedicated practice of just figuring out this. So I'd need to figure that out. And then what I could do is, this is, um, this is the second fret on uh, E string. So zero two for me is the sun. And so I would see Ernie with the sun. And now, how are you gonna do this when you're singing lyrics and you're seeing pictures in your head or visualizing and trying to land on this fret, you know? So basically the answer is to actually figure out the playing before you try to vocalize over it. And actually seeing that sun helps me remember that's where I got to go, right? Now again, if I wanted to, if I wanted to remember that it was G flat, I could get a hammer involved in there um, to bring that flattening sort of image or whatever. Uh, or if I wanted to call it F sharp, then I'd have a knife in there. So those are options. In any case, that's uh, basically how it works. Sorry if my singing was brutal and uh, as it should be. Um, we can't have every talent in the world, right? <laughs> uh, go H H. Uh, so yeah, I like uh, I like to to think about these things and to work on them, and it's just amazing. So one of these days, I'm gonna get back into studying Bach and revisit this because it's super useful, super powerful. And the, really the only, the only, uh, oh, HH, Hansestadt, Hamburg, Hamburg. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it, the only thing is, right, is that you actually have to sit down and do it. You have to know the major and then you have to think, okay, this is the eighth fret of the G string, what am I going to come up with there? How's the best way to do that? Here's a little secret. Don't do it with the instrument in your hands. Get out a piece of paper, work it out, and know the major method. And if you have a 00 to 99 already figured out, then you'll have all of it. You'll have all of it. You just then need figures for the strings. So, natural flow. My jazz piano teacher made me write down all the modes for each song, which went like 1, 6, 2, 5, 1, and all those others. Yeah, there's a reason why teachers tell you to write stuff. <laughs> all those students who don't uh, do it.
well, for them. But the reason why we're told to write things down, it, it's processing through a different channel. And uh, if you don't want to do it, no problem. But you don't get the results, or you don't get the same depth of results, you don't get them as quickly. But no guitar teacher, or well, bass teacher, I should say, has ever, ever recommended to me not to write stuff down. There's something called transcribing, which is just part of the, the lesson. You go and you, you like, I, I mentioned it, I, I, didn't, I couldn't quite figure out the notes for um, the uh, Marlena Dietrich's Dietrich song that I was just singing. I couldn't figure it out, so I just made up my own. But normally I'd press myself to do it. And it really behooves one to actually sit down and, and write it out. And one of the things that you discover in there is you see associations from a different angle that you didn't see otherwise from just reading music and so forth. And when I've had to write music for other uh, musicians, then uh, that's always interesting. Like when, when we performed the Magnetic Memory Method theme song at one point, I actually had to transcribe it for people. And I saw the relationships in it and I thought that was really neat. So the way that goes is... I played it, but it's got some more complicated parts like and it matters that those things are actually different because I'm reversing something in there but until I saw it on paper by actually writing it I didn't really see the relationships of what I what I had uh, composed anyway there's a reason why that we learn to transcribe in music and it's a, there's a reason why language learning teachers tell you to read, write, speak, and listen. And the emphasis is on actually writing. It doesn't matter, like with Chinese, it doesn't matter a damn whether or not I can write in Chinese characters or not. Got to write something. So make up your own pinyin until you know pinyin, and then write in pinyin, although pinyin's a bit tricky because there's seems to be like 40,000 different versions of pinyin. But it doesn't matter. The point is not whether it's the right pinyin or the wrong pinyin, it's that you're processing it through that channel. You want to race ahead? Do it. You want to stay glacial slow? No problem. But if you want to accelerate things, read, write, speak, and listen. And when it comes to these, like, people argue with about Romaji, and to the to the end of end of the day, they will they will come and argue and argue about how stupid Romaji is to learn. They don't even know that there are four kinds of Romaji, and they're willing to take the bat against just the idea of Romaji. There is an option for you if you're struggling, and you could just make up your own Romaji if you want, just to get moving forward, just to get it processing through your channels. P people just don't really seem to want to uh, embrace that in, in, in all its glory. Anything you want to learn, just get started and do it. So I always say DOC, that's the, um, that's the doing is the origin of confidence, doing is the origin of creativity and consistency and all those things, courage with something. And if you're humming and hawing over the right Romaji or oh, some guy says don't do Romaji and yada, 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 just move. Get your pen out and start to write whatever it sounds like to you so that you have that benefit. Now, this is back to music, you can build habits that are hard to break. Like I have some very bad habits, like how I hold my shoulders and so forth, and yada, yada, yada. And I have language learning habits that are kind of bad as well. But one of the things that I'll never forget from a music teacher is he said, you learn how to play those skills as fast as possible and clean it up later, right? This is so important. So many people just get frozen and they never move and they get frustrated and it's because they're not moving. Think of the Tin Man in The Wizard of Oz, right? He's just sitting there with his ax and he's frozen and he needs some people to come and oil him up, right? Okay, the oil is great, but once he's oiled up, he's got to just keep moving. So that oil in music might be just getting a scale into memory and pounding it out as fast as you can and cleaning it up later so you're actually hitting the notes, but you're memorizing it and then you just do. In language learning, it's just like, I have hard memorized this, I know what it's supposed to be, Maybe I'll make some mistakes, maybe I'll sound like an idiot, maybe no one will understand me, but I will just go and then I will write it down and, and, and process it through multiple channels and just move 
because you just need some oil. And like the Tin Man in Wizard of Oz, you need oil that moves you forward. Um, I got one of my fun little acronyms for you today also, which is the SIP principle, which is essentially just to study, implement, and practice. Study, implement, and practice. It's like taking a sip. See, look, I'm going to take a sip. Mmm. It's just that simple. Same thing with learning. Study something, implement it, and then practice. And in that practice, you could talk about cleaning it up. So pronunciation in language learning is very similar to pronunciation in music. If you're making some kind of mistakes on, on, on a scale or, you know, um, like there, I just made a flubber on purpose, but, you know, then I would just be like cleaning it up, you know? Whatever, I'm, I'm not trying to give music lessons here, but the whole point is, yeah, uh, Chris is writing sentences. Help me out. I remember this right. Chris, right? Uh, for natural flow. I hope so. Um, I'm going to be embarrassed as hell if not. Uh, Paul Cater says, great advice. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Paul. Thanks for being here. And uh, thanks for everybody who's here. If you're on the live and you haven't said hello yet, do say hello. Hit that thumbs up. Yes, Chris, for natural flow. Oh, magic. <laughs> it's, it's wonderful how it works. Um, so, in Vera Birkin, this is from Chris Natural Flow again. In Vera Birkenbill's book, Stroh im Kopf, uh, she teaches a made up language by just writing the in that, just writing in that language. After three minutes, I was able to write all the letters of the made up alphabet glyphs. Now, that's interesting. I have to check that book out. Well, in the German tradition, um, Ebbinghaus, of course, he made the very famous experiments with memorizing nonsense syllables and demonstrated that it's almost easier to memorize nonsense than it is things with meaning. And I always wonder about that. Is it really easier to memorize nonsense than things that have meaning? Or is it that people say, oh, this has meaning, and then they make it psychologically harder to memorize, right? I, I never quite really understood why that nonsense syllables should be so easy to memorize, a any easier than non s uh, words that have sense, because you're bringing a need that's different, and then you bring all your psychology, your your weakness, your your need, and and all of this stuff that just weakens you. When if you just pr approach it as play. Pretend it's just nonsense, which it is, until you know what it means, and you've got it hard-coded into your soul, deep in your memory. I mean, big deal, right? Um, so, in any case, it's just super simple. Simpler than a lot of people make it. So, we take a sip. Study, implement, practice. Study, implement, practice, and clean it up. Clean up what you practice. And you'll just get better and better. You'll have constant forward movement and improvement that will never end. And it's really, really powerful that way. So, yeah. And then if you make up music, like one of the perennial problems is you make something up and you're like, what the hell was that? Because I was playing something this morning that sounded kind of good. And I... just make a little character like we talked about at the beginning and I'd remember what that was so it's pretty simple you can remember what it is that you that you were working on though I'll tell you to be fair and we've seen this uh, pretty recently actually not that recently anymore but it's still pretty recently you can always just use your smartphone to record the phrases uh, as well that you come up with so Kirk Hammett in Metallica apparently had a whole bunch of riffs for the most recent Metallica album, which they never had any of his, his music on it because he lost uh, all the recordings. Which is kind of sad. Um, what else? Another thing when you're studying music, you know, is, is to really just learn entire albums. That's really good for your memory. Um, we often focus just on songs. But entire albums are really great to, to work on. 
and even just a focus on a musician or or a discography maybe not every song on every album but to really dive deep really understand the things that are going on and you'll start to sense preferences and so forth and what we've talked about today can really help you get it a lot faster and nail it a lot faster and it's just something that's wonderful so my experience with that is with the Bach um, cello concertos and I just learned so much and then because I internalized it so much I started to actually write music based out of what I had internalized from there so there's a thing that I made up I'm not sure I can play it anymore because it's been a long time but it's all it's all entirely based on uh, on Bach just just choosing the notes and uh, playing it so it was something like on like that and uh, all those notes I didn't have to choose any notes I was composing but I was just thinking about what could I do to rearrange the notes from Bach that I internalized that never would have got internalized if I hadn't had a special tool for helping me internalize them so that's a lot of fun um, and uh, yeah I love music music's really great it's great for your brain if you're not learning an instrument really excited to hear that Julie got a got a ukulele so Keep on rocking with that, and uh, it's so good for you. It's so healthy. Who who plays an instrument here? I'd love to, love to know. And uh, if you haven't said hello yet, please do say hello. Hit that thumbs up, and let me know if you have any questions about the major. Just to review what we were talking about, it's a, it's a means of memorizing numbers first and foremost, and because uh, every space can be represented by numbers, then you can use the major method to memorize that space. So your cell phone, for example, has a map in it and is doing that because the places represented on that map are numerically represented at, uh, uh, in, in coordinates, right? Same thing on the guitar. Everything here is a coordinate. And so this is the seventh fret on the E string, for example. And then there'll be a 14th fret on the E string. And uh, actually, this is another thing I didn't mention. But the, the fret, the, uh, at least on this instrument, everything is mirrored after here. So whatever's here is also on the 13th fret. And uh, that means that every single mnemonic character that you've made from here then can just repeat itself. Although I don't do it that way, you can do that. So you would just mentally represent it again over here. But I prefer to use major method and actually have another um, thing. So here's the Hoover Dam, for example. So Ernie would be doing something on the Hoover Dam. Um, so here he's getting a tan, here he's on the Hoover Dam. Uh, uh, is that right? No, here he's with the toad. Um, here he's getting a tan, right, because that's 12. Here's, here he's with the, with the Hoover Dam. It's been a while since I played around with this, but it's just beautiful. One of these days I'm going to write it all up as a book. Do you think you'd be interested in that? Let me know in the comments if you'd like to see this as a book or a full formal video course. We'd have to start from the foundations. I really wouldn't, wouldn't do it for piano because uh, I don't play piano often enough. I do, we, we have one here, but um, I'd, be, I'd be interested in, in making this a formal course for the, uh, for the master class, but uh, only if people are interested, of course. So Natural Flow, Chris says he's been doing piano since 1990 and you use the numbers to remember the song faster while you were still in the learning early learning phase of the song. Okay, cool. So, in other words, what you're saying is if you have an 88, if you have your 88 hammers in front of you, I don't know if you use that term in Germany or not, but in Canada we often call it 88 hammers uh, for a full, proper piano. You are learning a song and then you would rather than sit there and be like, okay, this is, this phrase, let's say, is, is AGD or something like that, you would actually just use the numbers. Oh, you're asking me, am I using the numbers? Yeah, if I was gonna sit down and do the piano, like I, I was teaching April the other day, Axel, Axel F, um, uh, or what is it called? Axel, whatever, the, the theme song from, uh, from, from Beverly Hills Cop. 
Is it Foldy and F? I, for whatever reason, I never memorized the name of the song, but I know how to play it. Do 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 I always feel on the spot with my memory. I was talking about this with Tanzel Ali the other day. I interviewed him on the podcast. So if you don't know Tanzel Ali, he's a multiple time Australian memory champ. Really, really great guy. We just get into get into some very interesting topics I know you're gonna love. If you're if you're not uh, subscribed to uh, the Magnetic Memory Method uh, podcast and you're not getting emails and stuff, go to magneticmemorymethod.com forward slash YT and uh, check it on over there. Anyway, yeah, when I was explaining the, the uh, theme song for Beverly Hills Cop to April, I just talked to her in numbers because it's faster and easier and, and she doesn't know all the notes uh, in English. She knows them in Chinese, but uh, it's faster and easier that way. So, let's see here. Martin says he's played guitar for 20 years by ear, recently violin, and a little piano. And he says a music book you would be really useful. Great. Well, thank you for letting me know, Martin. And in the meantime, I do recommend the interview with John McVedrin on the Magnetic Memory Method podcast. It's about heavy metal and it's about German and music. And it's sort of early days in these conversations we were having about how to nail this. And he ran with it. He went a lot deeper than I have done so far. But he's really fascinating to listen to and we've got an extended conversation about it and how it ties into German and so forth. Just because music is a language, right? It's not really that different than, um, than learning a language, mu learning music. So uh, Chris asks, with the major system, do you also have actions and objects for every number? No, I don't do that. Because, and I talked about this on a recent video, um, actually the one where, the, where, uh, where there was something of, a, something of a complaint about too much theory. But, the reason that I don't do that is because I'd rather be more flexible and uh, it's just, I just don't, I don't, I see the point for comp competition, but I don't see the point for everyday use of being that rigid. And, and, it, and one of the problems is, is because if you use the SIP principle, study, implement, and practice, then um, that study and implementation phase can take too long when the major is something that's going to evolve over time anyway. So get started and get rolling. And if you want to add an object and an action for every character, why not? But couldn't just to get rolling, and this is what I did, is some of those things, I couldn't figure, like for whatever reason, for 59, I couldn't come up with Jennifer Lopez. I couldn't come up with anything. And I used Leap, just the abstract concept of Leap for a couple of years, right? Now, I wasn't competing though, right? So the best advice I would give you if you were competing was don't, don't do that actually have a solid figure, have an action, and have an object, and so forth. I mean, people can figure this different ways. So it's, this is one more reason why we need to stop using the word system when it comes to mnemonics and talk about methods, and then understand that each person creates their own system. So some people will have that every 00 to 99 or beyond has all three characteristics. Other people will have that their 00, zero is a person, then there's zero one is an action, and then there's zero two is an object. Like, I mean, there's just variations upon variations upon variations. You've got to think, what's my outcome? What do I want from this, right? And at the end of the day, if you just want to be able to remember numbers, then just have a person action or an object for each one, just to get yourself rolling, and then refine over time. Because ultimately most, if you just go for figures, like if you just go for persons, I wouldn't, actually I don't like to lock it down to persons because Homer Simpson's not a person, right? He's a figure. And uh, a, a, an object, I mean you could use Homer Simpson as an object and likewise you could, you could use, um, what's it called? And, uh, oh I can't think of this word, it'll come to me. But uh, you, you can use, the, you can turn objects into personas. Right? Um, you can anamorphosize them. That's not the right word, but uh, anapomorphosize them. You can anapomorphosize them into objects. There, I had the uh, what's called the ugly sister effect there in memory for a second. You can uh, you can do that. You can make objects 
into people. And then as you go over time, you can realize, like I did with 59, okay, so I only had Leap for the longest time, which then forced me that whatever was before 59 had, had to either Leap or whatever came after it had to have Leaping. But when I finally got to Lopez, which by all counts should actually be 590, but it isn't, um, it, it, it just was much better. But I make sure, so that I don't get it confused with 590, that Lopez is always leaping, or as much as possible, to keep it, to keep it consistent and coherent. And I know when we talk about these things that if you don't know the major and so forth, this can sound like total madness, but just get into it, learn it. It's, it's a lot of fun, and it keeps your mind sharp, and it's, and it's really, really helpful. So Chris says, I just taught a 60-year-old the 52 cards for images using movies. Each card is a specific scene, actor, action, and object. It seemed very natural to him. He said, that's amazing. That's great. Um, and thank you for teaching older people. I usually am really excited when people are teaching younger people, but older people count too. There's no age at which this can't uh, start to accumulate value for people. I think any age you can start picking it up at some level. Uh, and we know that you know, Casper Bormans and so forth is doing it, or has been. I don't. I haven't caught, kept up with it recently, but he was doing amazing stuff with, with people for Alzheimer's and dementia and so forth. But I think that for beginners, just be flexible. Don't don't try to do so much at once with each and every one. Pick a person or an action or an object, and then add to it later. That's what I did. And the only hot water it ever got me into is the odd mistake that you'll make, which you'll make anyway, even if you are the best in the world, you'll still make the odd mistake. There's no getting around that. But the only other problem that I had is when I did finally go and compete and try competition, which I did more like as a memory, um, whatever it is that I do, uh, as a memory educator and, and uh, almost like a journalist. Journalist meets educator meets a big time diehard fan Nemonist who uses memory techniques every day, researcher, scientist, uh, guy. I did it as that, and I'm really glad that I did because I understood something that Nelson Dellis said when he was the guest host of the Magnetic Memory Method podcast, which is that practicing for competition actually requires you to compete because competition is itself something that requires practice. And so in my experience of it, and I never would have had, I never would have arrived at this if I hadn't gone to practice, uh, or rather if I hadn't gone to compete. Uh, for some of, at some level, these memory techniques in the competitions are not about memory. They are the equivalent of lifting weights. So the people who go to weightlifting competitions, they have their barbells and they have weights and then they are working with volume, sometimes duration, and so forth. There's an Olympic level thing to it. And the memory is secondary to the actual athleticism. It's just that the athleticism in this case is how much weight can you lift and for how long, that kind of thing. And so there's a certain sense there that, and I've always felt it intuitively, but I didn't know it until I went and did it myself, that that athleticism is different and it doesn't necessarily have a correspondence with what I teach and, and, and I'm just so glad that I did it because it made that difference even more clear to me and that will remain clear and it made me more passionate about this because there is training for training or, or rather there's training for competition then there's competition as a kind of training to compete better and then there's just using memory techniques and training to use memory techniques in everyday life. So when you know what you want, you want to learn a language, well then there's a process for that. And then you study, you implement, and you practice for that outcome. If you want to learn memory techniques for competition, then you study, you implement, and you practice for that outcome. If you want to use memory techniques to help you with math, then you study, and you implement, and you practice for that outcome. It's really, really simple. But they're not the same techniques necessarily, and they're not even used in the same way. So the memory palace is used very, very differently for language learning than it is for other things. And, and that's why you need that distinction. You need to show up to it and show up to it differently based on the outcome that you want and study and implement and practice differently based on the outcome that you want. I don't know about you, but I find that to be the most exciting thing in the world, 
to to be able to say, aha, okay, so we can approach these things differently. We don't have to generalize and we don't have to be frustrated that it's not working because we know that actually there are specific refinements and applications for specific outcomes. And crazy enough, there's this guy who really works on this every day. <laughs> so, you know, that, that, that's why uh, that's why this exists. That's why we're here right now. And it's, it's just amazing. It's to try and figure this out and to actually gain headway and to help as many people understand this for their outcome. Because there isn't a way to refine this for your outcome. Now there are some general guiding bird's eye view principles like study, implement, and practice. But then there are some nitty gritty things. And that's what we love to take care of in the in the in the master class and then of course there's a the memory connection which if you don't have it go to magneticmemorymethod.com forward slash connect and that will get you hooked up with the memory connection and its ongoing training option and uh, yeah and then you know there's also this which we talked about previously which you can check out that's uh, expired but still useful to watch the replay about the rap technique. We'll be talking about it later. But uh, definitely, uh, there's so much to be done and, and so much that you can do by being specific, by narrowing it, by being theoretical. And, you know, I tried to have a live stream about theory. We're going to have one later at some point in the future. And uh, I'm going to make a course around this little special formula because it dawned on me so much when, when that person um, basically criticized, well, you should have 13 million subscribers, but only if you put, basically he said, it, only if you have animations on the screen and, uh, and so forth, is that ever gonna happen? And I just thought, yeah, but I don't agree that those animations are really helping. Like I see all the competitors who do all this stuff and whiz bang things and they got millions of views and yada, yada, yada. But I don't see, I don't, I don't, I don't just don't really see the outcome of that because there's, there's actually some, untruths and problems that are being created by not being true to what these techniques really are and really diving in and refining them and understanding that each person needs to craft their own path each person needs to basically sip sip at it study implement and practice and when you generalize it too much you do a disservice to people or better said I'm very uh, honored and grateful and pleased and just to have the position in the world where I'm the guy who does this. So I thought about it. Yeah, okay, I could go and hire animators to show all this stuff. But the problem is, is that that would be a lie to mnemonics because mnemonics are not visual. They have visuality as part of them, but it's just one of at least six different aspects. And we need to open the door for as many people as possible. And you could argue, okay, yeah, go and hire animators and yada yada, and you'll open doors for gazillions and so forth. But I, I don't know. I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm willing to to stretch so many things. Somebody told me it's the uh, it's the um, the Scorsese principle. Scorsese makes one movie for the world, and he makes one movie for himself. And in other words, you would do something to create the budget. You would do something against your principles to create the budget to create what you wanted. I think you got to find a sweet spot and actually create something that is true to whatever it is that you think should be there. Because we already got a Scorsese, or we've already got a Steve Jobs, and we've already got this, that, and the other thing. And the, the best thing you can do to find satisfaction in life is to be you, <laughs> right? So the advice that I could have 13 million subscribers on this channel, well, that's really, you're never gonna force that to happen with all kinds of pyrotechnics and whiz-bang things. You're gonna have it happen through the truth more than anything, or at least it's gonna be meaningful through the truth. I have a lot of really successful entrepreneurial friends who have millions of dollars and they have millions of fans and they're just empty. They're unhappy. And they're unhappy because this, that just doesn't mean anything because they're not telling the truth, right? So always tell the truth. Isn't that what Jordan Peterson says? Uh, and by the way, thank you everybody who asked me about Jordan Peterson. I, I am now finally in the self-authoring program and, and I am going to talk about it. I, I, it, it has a lot of things that I expected that it would have because I've gone through psychoanalysis myself. I've gone through a lot of these things. One of the reasons that I am able to enjoy what I enjoy is because I've gone through those things before, but it's really excellent and I will be talking about it, but tell the truth. Tell the truth about your memory and tell the truth to everybody about it, about everything, because 
there is meaning to be had in life that you will not have. No matter how successful you get, you will never get that real fulfillment if you're not true to what it is that you want and how you want it. And it's just that simple. So Flyer Cow says, hey, uh, is there any chance of having a live stream on how to approach the learning of a programming language using memory techniques? Well, there's a chance of doing it, but the problem is, is that I'm not studying a, a, a programming language and every time someone emails me about it, I say, great, what's the language you're trying to learn? Tell me what it is in that that you need to memorize. And then they just, they don't really tell me. They don't participate in it. So if someone wants to actually teach me a programming language and or even better, help me do some stuff that I could do in Python or whatever the language is and teach it to me, I will, I will gladly talk about programming languages and memory till the end of the day, until the end of the week, until, until the end of all time. But nobody is really willing to take that call to adventure and show up and say, okay, you're, you want to be my student in Python or whatever, and I'll be your mentor, then you be my memory mentor, and we'll do something cool together, we'll create a course about it together, or however that's going to go. No, people just come with a handout, and their handout and say, teach me about programming language. That's not how it works. That's not the truth of this. The truth is, is we, if there are real true memory demands for programming, which I'm not convinced that there are because, you know, there's a lot of fill in the blanks stuff and there's guides that you refer to and so forth. So until someone can say, these are the memory demands, this is what needs to be memorized, here's where the struggle is, and someone wants to really show up to help do the work of it, then I can't really do anything about programming language because it would not be true and it ultimately wouldn't help people because everything that you need is already in the master class, right? Because it teaches you how to understand mnemonics. It teaches you how to understand these things and it teaches you how to create your own systems. That's the work that I do. And when you're in, on the path and you understand this stuff, then we can help refine your practice. And there's options if you want it for greater contact, so to speak, um, I do have some private coaching clients. I actually try to discourage it as much as possible, but some people persist, and so we make it possible. Um, and the reason why that I try to not do private coaching is because it's not, there's no coaching to be had, really, unless you have some real specific problems that you want to work on and you need that personal touch. There's no point in it because mnemonics is self study, it is studying and implementing and practicing. And if you're blind to what it is that you need to improve and personal touch is what you need, then, well, we can arrange it, but under, under, under special circumstances, and I need to test that you really need it and that it's not just, oh, well, I'm not willing to show up and do the work. But I'm very interested in programming languages, but every time I get asked, I, send, I should actually just uh, have, a, have a template email that just says, yes, I'm asked about this once a week. If you really would like to do this, tell me what it is that needs to be memorized in programming languages and uh, we'll rock and roll. But other than that, I'm studying music so I'm legitimately interested in it and, I, and I've talked about today what you can do for at least the guitar and uh, uh, for at least uh, what it's going to take to, to translate that to piano and trombone if you want and so forth. But it comes from that le legitimate truth of me having done it. And I don't like to teach things that I haven't done myself. I don't think it, I don't think it's authentic, and I don't think it's great to just to contemplate too much about what's possible with mnemonics without actually sitting down and doing it yourself. And actually, that's where the real teaching comes, even if you have a smaller audience as a result. So uh, I hope that's not a disappointing answer, Flyer Cow. But that's that is just the way I roll. I want to teach real memory techniques, and I want to teach them authentically for the people who want them. You want to show up and get this stuff and, and nail it from the path. So I think I'm more of a intermediate advanced teacher rather than a beginning teacher of these techniques. And I love it. I love to do it. I love to do it. I love to play it straight. No one would, uh, in, in university, no one would, would have an issue with a third year university course in literary theory or philosophy, yada yada, whatever you want to call it. Universities are apparently very dangerous places these days, so I'm kind of glad I don't teach at university anymore uh, with the freedom of speech problems and so forth. But anyway, imagine universities were cool and uh, everything was great. Then you'd have prerequisites. Do this and do that. Well, the prerequisite is, in this case, 
at the very least, take my free course. It's uh, pretty simple. YouTube, uh, magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash YT, and be on the path. Then, then we can talk. And if you want, there's, there's an option. I, I would love to do a programming course with somebody. Anyway, I know I'm going on and on about it. Flyercast says, it's okay. I totally get what you're saying. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, but I do, I do really need to stick with that because uh, I'm not studying a programming language, but it's as clear as day to me how I would do it. And that's already talked about in the master class, in the vocabulary memorization course, in the major method course, and in the ultimate language learning secret course. So Chris is back with, I have 81 as Lao Tzu, balancing the Tao Te Ching, Tao Te Ching as 99 as Gandhi, caring for salt. Because those things seem natural with these, I'm not sure what you meant with rigidity as it feels so natural, or pairing Muhammad Ali with a jumping rope and the rope-a-dope. And Ali is 82, so it seems natural to have Lao Tzu caring for a jumping rope. 819982, what am I misunderstanding? I don't know what you're, what you're misunderstanding. I only know that that's just not the way I would do it. Um, and it doesn't matter. The, the way you do it or the way that I do it is not the, the, the issue. The issue is the outcome. What matters is the outcome. So if that works for you, whether it's for something as simple as your bank PIN card, or it's like Brad Zupp, who if you haven't heard my interviews with Brad Zupp, you gotta listen to him because he's got some rigorous math stuff going on, or numbers stuff anyway. He's tackled the Mount Everest of memory challenges, which was pi or p, and he's just gone completely amazing, uh, what do they say in, on YouTube on all these videos, full biblical. He's totally unhinged with the uh, <laughs> with uh, his number stuff, and it's just his passion, listening to him talk about it and so forth. Well, who am I to say whether he's missing something or not? I mean, he's just doing it as he figured it out. You're doing it as you figured it out, and if you have a course about it, which I think you do, then uh, you know, share it with people, teach with people, and then when you see what other people struggle with, then you'll refine your teaching and. Uh, Ultimately, you're saying, okay, so I'm exploring options and your way interests me. Simplicity is so good. Ultimately, I would say the simplest way is to bury, bury <laughs> to base, potentially bury, but base your approach on the major method because it's the leanest, non-arbitrary method of them all. So yours just seems completely arbitrary. Um, just, oh, well, I'm going to pick lots of for that, and I'm going to pick da 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 for that, and da 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 for that. And that, I think, is basically what Dominic teaches. At, and that's just basically the classic PAO. Doesn't matter, just come up with some figures for the two digits from 00 to 99, or 000 to 999, or whatever. Go nuts. Just nail it in. To me, that's just, that just takes too long. When if you know the major, then you can rapidly come up with a starting basis for a 00 to 99 at the least and uh, and then refine it over time. So I've refined mine over time. I still make changes. What was the last change that I made? Um, it's not coming to mind at the moment, but there, there was one and it was just like, why didn't I think of that before? Um, I'd have to go through them all. Well, let's go. Why don't we go through the cards that, so we don't do um, all 00 to 99? But, um, so, well, I, won't, I won't say what the numbers are. You see if you can guess. Uh, Ace of spades is a toad. Two of spades is a tin can, a specific tin can. And it's a specific toad, by the way. I won't get into all the specifics. Um, uh, the three of spades is the, is the Hoover Dam. The four of spades is the Michelin Man. Why? Because he's a tire. He's a collection of tires. Five is a tail, but not just any tail. It's the tail of a specific dog, which actually happens to be the dog that's the five of clubs and uh, can that get confusing never it never does it actually helps because there are some duplicities throughout and they're actually very powerful so where are we at six is a dish but not just any dish a specific dish seven is a tack not just any tack but specific tacks and it can be tax or it can be a single tack depending on its use eight is a TV but not just any TV it's the TV from video drum nine is tape and it's a tapeworm from euphoria emporium which uh, is uh, a show that was in Kamloops anyway. Don't, don't, your tapeworm. Anyway, whatever. And uh, 10 is a nose, not just any nose, but the nose on uh, uh, Michelangelo's David. Um, 11 is, uh, oh, sorry, now we're, now we're at Jack of Spades. Sorry, I'm 
mixing with the numbers because Jack Spades is 21, which is a nut, but not just any nut. It's Jack uh, Nicholson in the in uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest slash The Shining. Um, then we have a nun for the Queen of Spades, and then we have Wyndham Lewis for uh, the King of Spades, which is um, a a, a miscall because he wrote a journal called The Enemy, and so 23 Enemy, um, not a clean one. That one I'm, I might change at some point. Uh, or sorry, no, that's not 23. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, now, Ace of Diamonds is is is, uh, is is sort of like a, it's the guy from Mad Magazine, but he's dressed as a maid. And then we have the man for two of uh, diamonds, but it's not just any man, it's, uh, it's the man in black, Johnny Cash. And then we have a mime, but not just any mime, it's a mime also from that show, Euphoria Emporium. Then we have a mare, which is not just any mare, but it's the nightmare from uh, Piers Anthony's Xanth series, and also sometimes fuses with Johnny Cash because of the Tennessee Mare song. Uh, where are we? we uh, Five of Diamonds is, uh, uh, I sometimes can't even remember his name, but anyway, it's the mailman from Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, Mr. McFeely, I think. Um, then six is a Match, in the hand of a character from M.A.S.H. Seven is Mac the Knife, but not just any Mac the Knife, it's that guy from the old McDonald's commercials with the moon head, who played Mac the Knife. Uh, then we have movie, not just any movie for Eight of Diamonds. Um, and then we have a map, but not just any map. Uh, sorry, it's a mop. Sometimes it's a mop, mopping a map for Nine of Diamonds. Then we go to Rice, and then we go to uh, Rat, but it's Splinter from, so, sorry, Rat is now Jack of Diamonds. Uh, Queen of Diamonds is Ran, it's the samurai from Kurosawa's Ran. And then we have Ram, which can be either a Dodge Ram truck, or it can be um, uh, related to the to the sports team. Anyway, you see, the, the, it goes on like this. Oh, this is the one I strengthened. Right, right, right. So Ace of Clubs, I used to just have um, uh, uh, a lad, like a boy, just the, the figure of a boy. And then I turned it to Alan Ladd, and I'm not really that big familiar with, with that particular celebrity. So then I figured out Alan Ladd with a latte. Then it was much more powerful. Then we have a lion, but not just any lion, of course, Aslan, uh, from uh, Lion Mission Wardrobe. Then we have a lamb, but not just any lamb. Then we have, this is, this is a tricky one, I used to use liar as a guitar, but then I got Jim Carrey involved, liar, liar, right? Then uh, we have, I mentioned the dog for Five of Spades, which is also Five of Clubs, which is Lily. Then we have um, leash, which is the leash that Lily uh, was dragged around upon. Then we have lock, like, um, it's, it's sometimes locks, sometimes it's John Locke. It's often enough, it's John Locke locked up. Then, uh, and actually there's a couple of John Locks. So there's like the philosopher, then there's the novelist, and so on. Um, da, 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 where were we? So that is 50, uh, so the seven of clubs. Then we have um, Leif Erikson, which is also sometimes Liv Schreiber, and sometimes it's a pile of leaves. So that's got three. Then we talked about Lopez. I use Lopez a lot because it's a classic example and it's one where you can make a mistake because I've put on the, the Z sound, which could make it 590, but it's actually 59, which is the nine of clubs. So I always make sure she's leaping, so it's 59. Complex stuff, right? Then we have cheese for 10 of clubs. Uh, not just any cheese, of course, because that would be wasting the potential. Very specific cheese. <laughs> Rick, my friend Rick in high school, we used to put cheese on bread and microwave it. So there's Rick's cheese, let's call it. And then we have, um, so that's 10, and then Jack of Clubs is Cheetah, and, then, and it's the Cheeto Cheetah. Then we have um, Chain and Fat Bastard from Austin Powers. And the chains are from Hellraiser. And then we have, um, that's Queen of Clubs. And then for King of Clubs, we have Jim Carrey. And uh, Jim Carrey is in a gym to distinguish him from the liar liar Jim Carrey. Now, just to complete it since we started, uh, Ace of Hearts is the fat lady, it's not over till the fat lady sings. Then we have Fan, which is De Niro from the movie The Fan, and sometimes an actual fan. Then we have the cast of Fame shooting foam, usually. Then we have Fire, and it used to just be this abstract concept of fire, but then for Four of Hearts it turned into Chuck Norris from uh, Missing in Action 2 shooting from a flamethrower. Now that's super powerful because then that flame can hit lots of cards before and after and up and down in all kinds of directions and it's really cool. Then we have um, Foil, uh, which is another one that I really need to work on and really improve. Um, and so what I did is I changed it to a fool with a foil 
And then that fool is John Hurt, who died not too long ago, who played, and uh, Chris, you'll know this word in German, he played the Nar, the fool, in King Lear. Um, so that works out real nice, because uh, he's the fool. Then uh, we have fish, not just any fish, I uh, won't get into which fish it is. Then we have fake for Seven of Hearts, which is actually Orson Welles, who was in a great documentary called F is for Fake. And then we have um, fife, which is a, a flute for eight of, eight of Hearts. Then we have viper, which is nine of hearts. And then we have a bus for 10 of hearts. We have a, a boat for Jack of uh, hearts. We have a bone and it's the bone from, uh, what's that movie called? Uh, 2001 Space Odyssey, you know, with the apes there. And then finally, to top it all off, we have a bomb, but not just any bomb. We have Hitchcock's bomb. So that's it, that, those are my cards. And uh, if I were to do 81, 9, 9, 8, 2, then that would be uh, the fat lady, uh, 8199. Um, so the big bop, uh, the fat lady with a big bop, and then with De Niro. So something like that. And it doesn't matter. They could be doing any action under the sun, or if I have an action associated with that, then they can be doing that thing. But rarely do I have an object involved. Some of them are objects, right? Like a leash is an object. So does it need a person? I can't think of one. If I was going to push it to a person, I might think of Alicia, someone named Alicia, for example. So I think it's just a waste of time to, to force yourself to have a person, action, object for every single one, unless you want to, and develop it over time. But if you just get enough to roll, like I did, bang, away we go. So Chris says, thank you, and, and you're welcome. I'm glad. I've always wanted to actually recite all the images for the cards. But um, it, it's really interesting too, right? Because what ends up happening is when you develop speed with it, like I've actually never verbalized it this way. <laughs> so it's a kind of slow and clunky, but when you're practicing with cards, you just see it and, and you don't have to verbalize it. You just, and when you have the memory palace in order and the way that I do it in the memory palace, it's quite fast. Now I, I, I practice, off and on and when I do practice I get faster again quicker and it's like muscles they strengthen they get the shape they get their form and then you start blazing and then if you don't if you're not studying implementing and practicing then the muscle will weaken over time so you just gotta expect that it's just like anything so I've mostly focused on using these things for for memory techniques but the beauty is is that these my numbers are strong enough that when I hear numbers and I encode these things I can normally just grab it so, um, for example, I don't have my chat on the screen, but I remember the fat lady with uh, the big bopper with uh, De Niro. So now I can tell that number that was on the screen, which should be 8199.82, right? So let me look. Uh, where the hell is it? Somewhere in the chat here. Um, 8199.82, right, so that's great. And you know, if you're tired, you might struggle a little bit more. Uh, Jonathan Levy and I had some fun experiences with this where we were testing each other and oh yeah I mean you can't uh, you can push towards perfection but what you'll get is like 99% accuracy at tops there's always mistakes for everybody even the best so natural says that's how I had it at first and the Florian uh, approach made sense to you well Florian's a competitor right so um, I think that I think what the competitors have to say is very wise for competition and I saw that wisdom when I went and competed because I ended up sitting there and competing. I still did really good. I'm, I'm still, as they say, chuffed by my experience with it. I'm very pleased by it because I was hungover, I was jet lagged, I'd never competed before. I actually wasn't expecting to compete. I didn't really understand how that particular competition was played out, so I was totally off guard in every possible way, and yet I still did really, really well. But I understood right in that moment that you train to compete and you need different techniques. What I do is different. My thing is everyday life, making sure it stays forever. What they do is just to win, and then you can forget it all. It doesn't need to last. Um, now, some of them, of course, would have strategies for making it last if they wanted, but if you're gonna go compete and memorize a bunch of cards or numbers or vocabulary or whatever, why would you want it to last? It's just mental noise. So I don't, I don't train for mental noise. I train for long-term things where I can learn new Chinese from my wife and just memorize it and be done with it, hear it once or twice, and then just work on pronunciation, getting better, putting it into practice. 
that's what I care about. I think it's what most people care about, and that's what I focus on. That's the work we do here. And I appreciate everyone who's here to be a part of it. Hit that thumbs up if you haven't already. If you haven't said hello, then uh, please do. Uh, Chris says, you were talking about remembering the cards that have fallen in the game already last week. Will you also remember the cards with action sequence many playing cycles later? Yeah, I'm thinking of doing a course on this, and I know you do poker. Um, we should talk about that, actually, because I think we could do a course on poker. I just need you to teach me poker. I'm not a gambling man. I did do some card counting at one point. I'm a magician, right? And one of the things that I knew immediately when I got into magic and I started to get fairly good at it, um, what ended up happening is I knew I would get my fingers cut off if I went and started to cheat. And I don't think that I naturally would cheat, but it's just, I'm not, I'm not, my dad always taught me. He just said, whatever you do, do not gamble. It's the stupidest thing you can do in the world. Gambling is stupid, and it always stuck to my heart. Now, I know that if you're very strategic and you know poker, you know how to count cards and so forth, then it's no longer really gambling. You're actually practicing mental skill. And so I, I'm not saying that I, I wouldn't ever get into it. But I know I could certainly, if I spent some time with it, I certainly could probably help people. But we should talk about it and uh, think about a course that we could do because there's probably one that would be a lot more helpful for people. Because some of the some of the books that I've read on memory techniques for poker, they probably help real hardcore people who already understand memory techniques refine their practice. But I've never seen anything that's entry level that would help people. And I, I you know, I know I'm not necessarily the entry level person either. But with someone like yourself, then maybe we could could uh, collaborate on something that would work and uh, help a lot of people get into that entry level. Uh, and I would certainly be level entry level because I'd first need to memorize the rules of poker first and what version of poker, because I really don't know the game. I don't, I don't quite understand it. I don't understand the river and all that stuff. But I'm deeply fascinated by it and I've read some books about it and, I've, and, I, and I have done some time with card counting. Uh, and of course, there's, there's just things that I do when I perform magic that can't be done if you can't memorize a deck of cards. And it's like next level stuff for, for magic. And the only debt is that you have to know, you, you have to know how to memorize cards and you have to, you have to be relaxed enough that when you make mistakes, they don't look like mistakes. That's the, that's the trick, right? And there's a lot in stuff in magic that's just bluffing. You're not even doing special moves or anything like that. You're just, you're just bluffing. Sometimes you do things that you want people to think that they catch you. And then when they're off guard, then you do the special move. But actually, there's no special move. Anyway, magic is a fascinating thing. If you're not a magician, get into it because it's really great for your brain. It's great for understanding human condition, for understanding different perspectives. I love magic. I love magic for multiple reasons. And it's not ever about fooling people. It's about connecting with them in different ways. I don't practice magic nearly enough these days. I did develop arthritis, um, which is sad, but, and it has affected my performance with, with cards, so my uh, leisure domain is not what it used to be, but it's still pretty good. And I just do it for fun anyway, right? Like, I'm sure, I'm sure that if I needed a, a paycheck, I'd be okay with magic. Ian Rowland said, and I think he's just quoting something that he heard elsewhere, but he said something that always stuck with me. Is that anybody who can do a good magic trick will never go hungry or thirsty. And I think that that's true. And it's one of the reasons why I always, I, I just want to help people so much with memory techniques, is because I'm quite confident that if you get memory techniques, you'll never go hungry or thirsty. You'll always be able to learn. You'll be able to learn quickly and you'll be able to put it into implementation, whatever it is that you want to do. You will, you will. And uh, same thing with music. So if you've got to learn how to perform on the street and you don't know how to play music, well, your opportunity to do so is there. Rhea's here, love your streams, Anthony. Thanks for letting me know, Rhea, if you're just hopping on, hit that thumbs up button. Let me know where you are in the world and, and I really appreciate it. We're gonna sum up here, we're gonna wrap up. If you missed the wrap thing, it was on uh, one of our previous sessions. Go and check that out. I'm apo I apologize, some of the recent lives were, uh, were screwy, the connection's been bad, and I can't figure out OBS. 
Speaking of being able to learn stuff, there's something deeply technologically wrong in my computer. I'm looking for a computer mentor, actually, who can help me figure out some things. There's, there's some things that are really gray areas for me. And here's a learning tra tactic for you. Don't always try to learn everything on your own. Go and find mentors. And, and, and so I'm meeting a mentor tonight, actually, uh, to see if I can get some help, extended help, lessons. So it's not just about memory. It's about actually being guided through things, being shown, tailor-made to what it is that you need, right? This is really important. Don't, don't always try to do things on your own because you could be memorizing the wrong stuff and then wind up just way off track, right? Because you were too proud to ask for help. So I'm, yeah, sip, study, implement, and practice. But when you need help, reach out for it. There might be a heavy price to pay for it, but if you trust the guy, you know the person, you like the person, then just invest in yourself, right? You're not only helping them become better teachers, but you're erasing blind spots. And if it doesn't work out, you know, I, I've gone for consulting many times and paid a pretty penny for it. And often the outcome is uh, surprising because you often hear just what you needed to hear, even if it's something you already know. But you're hearing it in that context and having skin in the game changes everything. So it's really, really important. We're gonna talk at some other time about this and we'll talk about this some other time. Thanks for putting that up there, Chris. Study, implement, practice. And speed of implementation. Yeah, you're right, that speed in implementation. <laughs> we got so many things. Um, and by the way, if you're the kind of person who just doesn't learn from video courses, go to magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash connect. We'll hook you up and uh, sip. And of course, we also have just a free memory training at magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash YT. Get in there. Get some training. Get some training. So Danny's here. Hey, Danny. Thanks for being here. I'm sure the names Simon Aronson and Juan Tamirez are familiar to you. Yeah, well, Mnemonica is a great book. Uh, I haven't read a Simon Aronson book, but his name comes up a lot. Um, you know, Tamirez teaches a way of memorizing a deck of cards that I th think must be helpful for some people, but... I totally, it makes me cringe, it makes me cry. Uh, and a lot of these card guys, the way that they teach uh, card memorization, they, they frown, they frown upon using mnemonics for it. But then they just teach mnemonics from another, uh, from another angle. So, what can I say? Um, Rhea says, what was the link for coaching? Uh, please email me for that. Uh, we want to email about uh, about any coaching. Um, I haven't given a link for coaching on the stream, and I probably never will. If you if you really want, I, I wouldn't call it coaching though. I, let's call it, uh, it, it what it's called is a strategy session, because coaching is like you can do it, guys. Yeah, of course you can. You just gotta want to. But I'm walking you through specific problems, and the assumption is that you're on the path and you just aren't seeing something. You need your perspective opened or you need to hear the right thing in order to get over a hump and so forth. So I'm not gonna teach the major method, or I'm not gonna teach the magnetic memory method on a coaching session. It's not gonna work. Um, and I'm not gonna uh, rah, 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 and you can do, of course, I'm gonna be encouraging and, and, and that, that is a part of it. But coaching, I think there's really two things when it comes to coaching. Coaching is like the guy asks you questions or you ask questions, which is not So that's more like consulting. So if you ask questions and I answer them, then that's not really coaching. But coaching is more like just asking you questions. And do you need, a, do you need to be pay, paying somebody to ask you a bunch of questions? Uh, I don't know, maybe. Uh, but basically, coaching is gonna be, so what have you been doing? And, and okay, and uh, how, how do you feel about that? And what have you observed about that thing that we talked about? Hmm. Like, do you need to pay people to ask you those questions? You can ask those questions to yourself, right? Uh, but when you need someone to help you see what you're not seeing, then of course you can unlock entire worlds. And there may be some of those questions that are coaching-like. And I'm not trying to talk you out of emailing me for my link to my coaching registration page uh, or my strategy session registration page, but I'm trying to be really clear so that nobody, nobody is uh, disappointed by what happens there. It's about helping you past humps because you're on the journey.
because you know the major method, because you know memory palaces, and you're still stuck. That's what we can do. I can't do anything beyond that, because otherwise, it's study, implement, and practice. It's just that. It's that. Study, implement, and practice. So if you want some of my personal time beyond what we do here, then let's be clear about what it is that we're going to do there. And you need to be on the path. And I, I, I'm, I really am sus suspicious of the whole coaching industry, although I know that I need it. But it's more better. Personal training is better. So when I needed training, I went to a gym instructor who knew what he was doing. He looked like I want, what I wanted to look. And, you know, the muscles started to pop. I'm not trying to show off here, but I never used to have anything like that. And not, maybe that's not all that impressive. It's impressive to me. And it's impressive to my wife. But ultimately, what ended up happening, is, and he told me this too. He said, regardless of how long you stay with me, my goal is to teach you stuff that you can do on your own so that you don't need this anymore. And that's what happened. And actually, my biggest growth came after I left Germany and was no longer there. I would have continued to stay training because I really liked it. But the truth is, is that my biggest growth came from implementing what I learned on my own and then studying other stuff, implementing it and practicing the implementation. That's where my biggest gains came from. So he really helped me craft a foundation and then what ended up becoming the, the Adonis figure, so to speak, if I can be with Uh, 